system at SI and been shot down. I wanted to bring like that. Yes. So I just want like a super soaker for when they do that. Wouldn't that be great? I hear you. Or when they touch each other. I hear you. I'm just Absolutely. saying, I think it would be brilliant and really effective. I think it would really only take ones, especially in the winter. Like you go back outside and it's really hey, cold. Can I just we can go back to when, you know, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there were ones with the fourth grade. We taught fourth grade class. Yeah. Table was all, they sat very Mennonite. Yeah, 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 yeah. Table was all, they not stop talking. He was the teacher, I was the bouncer. So, and then he was like, you know, this was a water. And I walk, I told them more than whatever. I walked behind her and I told them to You know? And the room went, whoo! It was like, like it's just, yeah. And so then afterwards, I just walked to her parents and, you know, sort of like, ask them. Like, no, no. Not only do their parents like condone it, they encourage it. That's what I that's, I'm sure she was so sheepish after that. Like, well, I mean, the girls too. It could have been one of the boys who would have laughed. Yeah. But, you know, it was. That's so funny. I walked in a small group last week, and my girls, I was at the chair's out, so I knew they were at least six feet apart. Talking. Obviously, two of them had stood up super close together. And she's sitting on the chair, her ear up, I just grab it and pull her, like, six feet away. She looks at me and I'm like, I put that chair there. I know you look at I put this here five minutes ago. She's like, I was like, I don't care. What are the rules here? She was like, oh, are you a senior? Can you listen? Okay, very good. Let's not do this anymore. I think I, I, I am honestly proud of myself for waiting a whole year to do that. That was a process. But, uh, yeah. Yes. Sitting in a conversation too far away. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 
Castleberries at the house on Zoom. Oh my yeah, I'm watching you all. Pay attention. Oh, good. I'll Are you quiet. okay? All right. It is great to see you guys this morning. Good to be together. Um, as I mentioned in our email, we're going to get started with an interview, but I have uh, more announcements than usual. So we're going to start with those this week while I, I have your captive attention because some of them are important. So, um, correct, correct. You're, you're really reading into it. So, um, first, uh, um, want to make known to us our uh, desire to pray for one another. So, you guys know this as well as I do that. Uh, if we look at the prayer request emails that Rania so lovingly sends out, uh, some weeks there's not very many on there, um, and uh, I'm equally guilty of that. This is the first week I've sent one in, so you know, culprit number right. one, right? So. Yeah, culprit number one over here. But um, <laughs> with that, um, I just wanted to take just a, a few seconds to remind us of why this is important. Um, if you'll remember, way back in September. Uh, we said there were a handful of things we wanted to persist in, right? We wanted to mark this class, and uh, being dependent on the Lord in prayer was one of those. And so that gives us the opportunity um, 
I just realized I haven't asked this. Zoom people, can you hear me? Oh, okay, good, good. Could have had a, a hiccup. Um, but it gives us the occasion to pray for one another, to remind one another of what's going on in each other's lives. And I really do think it, it creates a sense of family that we really do hope would mark this group, that it's more than just, ah, uh, we come and we study the Bible with those people. As good as that is, that uh, there's a greater sense of togetherness, of practicing the one another's of scripture. And so I also wanted to make known that if you're uh, not a fill out a prayer request on a card type of person, um, that doesn't work for you or you're uninterested in that, you can always just send them to me and I'll forward them to Rania to go out with the class email. Uh, that's easier for a lot of people, I think. Um, yeah, I don't find myself often remembering to, to fill out a card. So, uh, but please do engage in that. We think it's valuable. Uh, I think you guys think it's valuable as well, uh, but I think it's hard to get in the rhythm of that. So um, let's hold one another accountable to that so that we see and know one another in ways that we can pray and care for one another. So any questions about that before I move on? Great. Second announcement. Um, you guys are probably more privy to this information than some of the other groups, but we're announcing it in all of our Sunday morning groups. Um, next Sunday, in the Sunday after, there will be meetings about a potential new church plant that will begin in the Heights. And so uh, that's with Dan Southam. Hopefully you guys know him. He's the one who kind of looks like Loki right now, if you're familiar with the Marvel movies. So, uh, but you can, um, I would invite you, and especially if you're someone who uh, already calls the Heights home or lives near that area, uh, to at least attend these informational meetings and get a sense of what's happening there. Um, yeah. The going to the informational meeting doesn't sign you up for anything. It just makes you better informed. Even if uh, that doesn't end up being for you, it lets you know better how you can pray for the things that are happening there. And I know many of you are already considering that, um, but I would urge you in that direction. Dan's a man that I respect greatly, a uh, great brother in the gospel and in ministry. And so you would do yourself well if that's already closer to your home to consider what it would look like to be a part of their team there. So if you have more questions about that, you can ask me and I will pretty much just point you to Dan. So maybe you just email him, take out the middleman. It'll make a lot more sense. So announcement number three, um, and we mentioned this last week, but I wanted to explain it a little bit more that next week we will have some high school students joining us uh, in our class. There will be six of them. I've been in contact with them. They're all divvied up. And, um, I wanted to explain a little bit of the heart behind this and some of the logistics. So uh, there will only be six of them in hopes that we can accommodate them via our space. Uh, it already feels full in here some weeks, so we're obviously not going to take on a great deal more people. Over the course of this semester, uh, my colleague Dan Shalero has been meeting with the high school students in Sunday morning, but it's been different from what we've done in the past. And the goal has been to explain why the church matters beginning at the high school level. So you guys, uh, some of you have, uh, I actually know if any of us have high school age kids. No, we might be over. Yeah, all right, all right. Um, and so um, we have high school students, we've been high school students, we interact with high school students here at Parkside. Um, and if you've seen the statistics and, and all the things that go into that, kids who don't get involved in the heart of the church, meaning kids who just kind of come and go to youth group and that that's their experience. Oftentimes they go to college, they begin to think for themselves. So they think, and they find themselves no longer valuing church attendance, being involved in any meaningful way. We think it's a priority to address that. And so we're trying to do so by uh, informing students of what it looks like to be involved in the church and urging them to do so uh, at the high school level. So part of that will impact us is that next week, um, we will have these six students with us getting a glimpse and experience of uh, what a Sunday morning group at Parkside looks like, what it looks like to sit with adults, to learn from adults, to uh, chime in, hopefully, and be a part of things. So um, with that, we are taking all the precautions we can of recognizing we're already trying not to mix groups, and um, we've tried to be as COVID conscious as possible throughout the semester, but we're continuing to try to do that. Um, Naturally, I assume the high schoolers will all sit uh, nearer to one another. And so if you are particularly conscious about that, we will put them on this side of the room and you can sit on this side and they won't get their feelings hurt. And if they do, they'll suck it up. So, um, but just um, the reason I say that to you is so, you know, philosophically as a church that we're moving in this direction, we think it's important. Um, a lot of these high school students and COVID has been a catalyst for this. have gotten involved in serving in children's ministry and in other places where uh, they're beginning to use their gifts for the sake of the gospel, which we're really grateful for. Uh, but also
also, you will see some familiar, unfamiliar faces next week. And I would encourage you to welcome them, um, try to get to know them. They will only be here for a week and then they're moving on to see some other things, kind of sampling life at Parkside, at least knowing what those things look like. So um, does anyone have any questions about that? Turns out all the announcements are really important this week. <laughs> this is a rare thing. All right, well, if that is the case, then here's what I will do. I'm going to invite Kelsey up, who we're going to interview this week, and uh, we're going to get to know her. So you stand in front of here so our student friends can see you. And I to fight this mic. No, please see. It's hard to hear me yeah. anyway, so. Yeah. Okay. Friends on Zoom, if I'm loud from over here, can you hear me? <laughs> Terrific. I love that. All right, let's start with this. Um, I just said your name, but you can rehearse it. <laughs> um, tell us where you grew up, all right, what you do for a living now, and then uh, just a hobby of yours, something you have a great interest in. Okay, so um, my name is Kelsey Smith, and I grew up in this area. I did not grow up at Parkside. Um, I came to Parkside when I graduated high school, but um, I grew up in Bedford and then we moved to Chester. And, um, grew up in actually like really tiny church, so in Parkside. <laughs> it was a big change. Um, and then currently I work for my mom, who's also in this class, um, and she is an artist and I help her run her business. So I do everything from photography to graphic design to sometimes bookkeeping. <laughs> and some of you know how much I love that. Um, so yeah, so I work, uh, we work out of her house and out of mine. And um, we have like an online store and she teaches and we do supplies and things like that. So um, yeah, that's what I do. And then a hobby, um, I would say like, lots of outdoors type things. I love camping and hiking and identifying wildlife and things like that. So that's some of my hobbies. Local flora and fauna. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, briefly, uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you came to faith, what that looked like in your life? Yeah, so um, I grew up in the church and I, um, I came to faith as a young child. Um, and have watched, I definitely like watched the Lord like work in my life over the years. Cause sometimes I'm like, was that real? And was it not? And I think it was, cause I have this like really strong memory at age nine of like being like, I don't, I feel like I'm not very good at reading the Bible. And I was like praying that the Lord would help me to read the Bible. And so like, it's just been a, a prog progressive thing. Um, college hit and that was like a really hard time because a lot of the new like postmodernist stuff is I went to a public institution and so I hit a point where I was like not sure about a lot of things. But the thing I always remember is like I always knew that I loved the Lord and that his word was true. So that's great. Thank you for sharing. Uh, as fits our usual pattern, would you tell us uh, about a hero, a hardship, and a highlight that have marked your life? Okay. So I have a lot of heroes. Um, the one I will give today is a friend who goes to a church that I grew up in. Her name is Belinda. She is a retired kindergarten teacher and she has been single all her life. And she's just one of those people that makes singleness not seem like a bad thing. Um, and so she just lives so graciously. And so like she has more children than most women who have biological children. Um, and just watching her faith and she and I are very similar in like the way that we think like that and so it's just been it's been amazing to have someone who like understands the way that I think and also like has modeled what it is to like mother people who are not your own like biological children. Yeah. So. Um, and then a hardship I think would be I feel like the transition from college into like working life was pretty hard because I have a degree in museum studies which I obviously do not currently use um, and just trying to figure out, like, you know, it's like, it's very tempting to feel like I've wasted all this time, but like God doesn't waste time. And so um, I think that it's very difficult to learn how to give up those dreams, but it's also like the Lord shows you that like, it's like the question I always want to ask is like, well, why, like, why did I have to go get a museum science degree and then, you know, only work in that for a little bit? And I think that like, the thing that you learn is that the why is not the important question. It's always the who. Like whenever people in the Bible ask God why, he always answers with who he is. And so um, 
I guess that's that's sort of like how he has brought me through that. Um, and then a highlight, I think, actually has been coming to Parkside because I came out of a rough small church situation and it took me a really long time to get plugged in here. But like once I did, I have made some amazing friends that I just love and like the community that I found here, though it can be sometimes difficult to find in such a large place once you do find it. Um, the people of God are so encouraging. So. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I'm going to pull up something on the computer here. Um, some of you may know, some of you <laughs> don't know. And so this would be occasion to share this, that uh, Kelsey has for our class and even when Dan was here, uh, um, has been um, creating artwork as we studied through books of the Bible. And so uh, as part of her interview this morning, she's going to um, give us a little bit of an insight into what that looks like for her. Um, and yeah, tell us a little bit of her heart behind it. So um, this is just an example of what she has currently done for us, but I'll turn it back over. Yeah, so for those of you who've been, who were in dance class, he did this thing at the end of every book, he would have people bring in, and he stole this from Matt McCalvey, um, <laughs> he, which he openly admits. He would have people, we would do like a reflection day at the end of studying a book. And so he would ask people to bring in a piece of art or a poem or anything, or just a small reflection. And so um, my sister would bring in poems and I, you know, would start to bring in art. And, you know, I was just, I think it was a really funny thing. I was randomly in the bookstore and my sister and I were just talking about like art in the church. And we ran into Dan and just started talking. Like he was like, "What you guys talking about?" And like we were talking about this, and he's like, "Hey, I have an assignment for you." He's like, "Where's what?" I'm trying to think what the first one we did was. I think it was Second Corinthians. He was like, "Can you make an, a piece of art that will go with it to be the whole way?" And we were like, "Sure." <laughs> um, so so we made that. So and that sort of just started a tradition. Sometimes Carly and I have done it together, and sometimes um, I've done it on my own, and. Um, so what I do when I, I go through these things is usually I do like a cursory read of whatever book that we're going to be doing. Um, and I was very excited that we're doing Hosea because I actually, I love Hosea. And right after college, I did like a, just a study on a personal study on Hosea. And so as soon as I heard Hosea, like the first thing I think of is Hosea chapter six, verse one, which is come, let us return to the Lord for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. I'm like, okay, tear it. There's something in there, right? <laughs> um, I'm like, but well, what am I tearing? And um, and this is where like ideas and techniques sort of overlap in my brain. And um, so, and as I read, what I do is I sort of just like, I read and I try to like see, I try to visualize because it, especially in these, like there's a lot of visual imagery. And so it's like, what, what am I seeing as I'm reading? Um, which is a very common thing in poetry, very easy. When I did Romans, I was like, oh, <laughs> um, this is not poetic or metaphorical, uh, <laughs> um, which oddly enough, that one also ended up being a treat. But um, so then in Hosea, I'm like, okay, there's something about tearing. And um, I got to chapter 14 and it talks about, I can't get my page turned this on. Um, in chapter 14, five through seven, it basically describes Israel as this tree that is growing and blossoming and rooting out. And what was interesting is that right now in my personal study, I've been very, very slowly reading through Isaiah and sort of doing that. It's one of the, like, I like reading through a book and just like sort of letting it wash over you before you really get into like the nitty gritty, especially when you're reading poetry, because it is so much about like metaphor and visual and there's a whole bunch in Isaiah about trees. And I was like, oh, trees, trees. Okay. <laughs> like we've got something here. Um, and then I was like, but there's something about tearing. And there's, there's this Japanese art in pottery where they take broken pottery and they fix it using lacquer. But in the lacquer, they mix in gold, silver, or platinum. And so I should have brought a picture of that, but you can uh, look it up later. I'm going to probably say it wrong, but it, it's called sometimes kintsugi, which means golden joinery, or kintsukuroi, which is golden repair. And so you have these dishes that are broken, but then have this really beautiful, like they mend the cracks and it's more beautiful. And so for this piece, what I ended up doing was I was like, the, the picture that we get at the 
end of Hosea is Israel as this tree that is blossoming and fruiting. But in order to get there, the Lord has to sort of tear them apart. But that in the end, it is the binding back together. So I actually literally sat down and sewed with gold thread. I tore up my artwork, which that was hard, guys. <laughs> I was like, okay, now I have to tear it. And I'm like, I feel like maybe this is a little bit how the Lord feels when he has to tear. It's like, ugh, like, it's like, I know it needs to happen, but it's hard. It's hard to like rip up a piece of artwork that you spent all the time drawing and painting. And, and then I stitched it back together. So I actually, I have, um, I have it in person if you guys want to come up and look at it later, but um, this is what it ended up looking like. So it's actually like, it's separate from the piece of paper, but um, I literally, you can see on the back, like I stitched it with a needle and thread, which is more difficult than I anticipated. Um, but, um, and so that was really like, to me, it's the picture of Hosea that like, there is this beautiful thing that Israel will be and God sees that, but he has to tear them apart so that he can put it back together. And that it ends up like that the, re the redemption of that, it ends up being more beautiful in a sense, um, the way that he puts that together. So that's pretty much how that came, all came through. So well, thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you for that. You know, we, we benefit from uh, people who are willing to lead us in that way and uh, have skills that they can contribute. Uh, you know, I could, I could draw a tree too, but it's more showing to <laughs> <laughs> We'll leave that to you, but you serve our class in that way, and it's been great to get to know you. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, stop share. We're back. All right. Um, I did not intend this. Um, in, in God's kindness, um, I think Kelsey just gave us a perfect introduction for where we're headed this morning. Um, so I can't take any credit for that. I wish I could. It'd feel good to be like, I planned this all myself, but um, I cannot. But um, we are in the book of Hosea. If you turn there with me in the second chapter. Um, in this morning, we're going to look at verses 2. So 2, 2 through 13. Um, and um, I'm going to pray for our time together and for uh, Kelsey as we've gotten to know her, and then we will look to God's word. Hosea 2, 2. Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife and I am not her husband. That she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts. Lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born. And make her like a wilderness and make her like a parched land and kill her with thirst. Upon her children also I will have no mercy because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, therefore I will hedge up her way with thorns and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for bail. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time and my wine in its season, and I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. And I will put an end to all her mirth, her feasts, her new moons, her sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts. And I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, these are my wages, which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall devour them. And I will punish her for the feast days of the bales, when she burned offerings to them and adorned herself with her ring and jewelry and went after her lovers and forgot them, declares the Lord. Let's pray. Our triune God, we come before you this morning grateful that we get to gather in this way. Lord, we are amazed uh, that 
you give us the church, Lord, that we're not only united to the Lord Jesus in faith, but we're also united to his people, united to one another. Lord, that we get to share life together, to learn together, to bear one another's burdens, to love and prefer one another, to pray for one another. And Lord, what a great privilege that is. We thank you for Kelsey, uh, as we heard a little bit more about her life this morning. Thank you for the way that she serves our class and uh, providing artwork in, in a different way for us to understand and visualize what it is you communicate through scripture. Lord, thank you for all of the ways that you invite us to use our gifts and to serve one another and ultimately to serve you and make you known. Lord, we pray as we turn to these verses this morning that you would give us humility to bow before you, that we would have an eager desire to be uh, instructed and even confronted by your word. Lord, help us to turn our eyes, to not get swept up in the details of uh, all that could be confusing to us, but to look to Jesus, to recognize what you've done in him. Lord, we thank you for this time and pray and ask that you would use it for our good and your glory as you've promised to do. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Um, if you look at the end of verse 13, which I just read for us, it ends with this, declares the Lord. And so uh, we're given um, a piece of transition defining material here that what we read in this section is God speaking. Right? We're no longer first person uh, hearing from Hosea as we were at other points. We um, have made a transition and God is speaking. Therefore, that brings with it some questions we have to answer from the outset. Because when Hosea says uh, of his wife or his children, we are very clear about who he's talking about. He has a real wife and he has real kids. When the Lord is speaking about plead with your mother and uh, speaking of the children, we have to, to ask, who is he talking about, right? Like, who does this represent? And so uh, I'm going in line with what most scholars would say, and I think this makes sense if we think about it this way, that um, the mother, when the Lord speaks of this, is Israel as a social and cultural impact, okay? And so it's Israel as the religious leadership shapes them, Israel as their idolatry has formed them. It's Israel in the way that they impact one another and impact the world, all right? And so uh, that can be a little bit confusing. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But then that means the children described in this, the children are um, the average, everyday, ordinary people of Israel who are shaped by this culture, who are impressed on by what Israel has become in their rebellion and in their idolatry. And so what we're going to see and what Kelsey said so helpfully set us up for this is that um, part of what the Lord is saying here is that if you are to be true Israel, if you are to behave as I have called Israel, my people to behave, you are actually going to have to turn your back on Israel as it currently exists, right? If you are to be the faithful people I have called you to be, you will have to distance yourself from what God's people look like right now. Uh, because they are a ways off from what God has called his people to be. As we think about this, and it sets the stage for us, um, we begin with similar thoughts of thinking, if we today, right, uh, way in the future from when Hosea wrote this, if we are to be the people God calls us to be, the church that he has called out for himself to be a faithful remnant of his people, in some ways we will have to turn our back on and distance ourselves from American evangelicalism and what it's become. Right? We will have to be willing to regard purity as more important than popularity. We will have to uh, be willing to value right doctrine over individualism and expression and believing whatever we might want to. We will have to learn to value the good of the church, of the group, collective over the individual. Right? The, the church must be marked by laying our lives down for one another, as Jesus has done. And so I think this book speaks greatly to us in these verses, uh, begin to lead us into that. And so you can see on your handout, um, put it quite simply, the Lord vows to redemptively punish Israel for their spiritual adultery. And so when we see this redemptive punishment, we're going to see that the Lord is saying he must take an axe to the tree that is Israel. And he must cut it all the way down so only a stump remains from which a righteous remnant will grow out of. 
from which the people as they ought to be will grow up. So we'll look at this in two headings. If you look on your handout, in verses 2 through 5, we see commands and consequences. And then in verses 6 through 13, we see God's redemptive judgment. So I've just put the text on our handout for this week in a spot for notes on the back in hope that uh, as we follow this around you, or as we follow through this, you can mark this up and um, make sense of some of the divisions. Because I'm aware, and therefore going to keep uh, throughout this, my teaching shorter than we did in James, because we're going to have more questions, I think. There are going to be things that are harder to understand. Um, it's been that way for me. I anticipate uh, it being that way for all of us. And so we will need more time to say, hold on a second, I don't understand what you're saying. Um, and I would encourage that, right? If there are things that aren't clear, Clarity is something we value. We don't just want to go through the motions. So interrupt me. Tell me that I haven't been clear. And we'll look again. But in verse 2, as we began, we see uh, this command uh, or this instruction that God is giving. Um, and he says this, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife and I am not her husband. It's a really tragic scene when you think about it, that the depiction is of a marriage so decimated that mom and dad no longer talk to each other, right? They need uh, children to go between, uh, to be some sort of mediator. Maybe you encounter marriage situations where this has uh, been the reality. And we see the instruction is plead, plead with your mother. Now, we mustn't think that when we think of pleading, that this is some sort of begging of God, right? This uh, is less related to... Um, this pleading, begging, oh, please, I need you back. But it's of warning, as we see, because the promise of judgment will follow it. It's as if God is a husband speaking tenderly to his unfaithful wife. And he's saying, darling, if you don't stop this, this will ruin us. This will be our end. So plead, plead with your mother. And he says, for she is not my wife and I am not her husband. Now, if we take this at face value, we're, we're left to think, I don't understand what is happening here. It sounds like they, they've already been divorced, right? It sounds like the split has already happened. But based on what we see after this, that, that wouldn't seem even to make logical sense. I don't know a husband who pursues divorce with an unfaithful wife, and then after doing that, decides it's time to plead with her to come back. It, it seems backwards in my mind, and I think you uh, can see that. And so I think we're best to understand these as it's the Lord saying, for you're not acting like you're my wife. You're not acting or living functionally out of the fact that I am your husband as he speaks to his people. And then the content of the plea, as we move into verse three, uh, I'm sorry, um, the second half of verse two, is he says this, tell her, right, plead with her that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts. It is as if to say, and, and um, you know, please take this at face value. There's a, uh, a way in which we have to talk about these things to understand what's being said. It is like a husband saying to his wife, right, that come hither glance only gets directed toward me, right? Don't look at anybody else that way. I don't want to see that in your eyes when you look at someone else. It's this idea that Israel has grown to be a people who are adulterous, right? They're looking longingly at other gods the way they were instructed to look at Yahweh. We see a similar picture to this in the second half when he says, in her adultery from between her breasts, this is likely making reference to uh, the way a prostitute would have dressed in the ancient Near East. It's actually quite possible that this isn't just spiritual, although we know it is. The book is about spiritual adultery. But based on the context of them worshiping the Baals and what we know about that, the Baals were a fertility cult that uh, often called their adherence into what the Bible would make plain as sexually immoral, it's improper, it's wrong. And so it's quite possible that the people of Israel, and I would say even likely, that they are physically prostituting themselves at this point. And so he's describing them as if that is the case, that they're spiritually and physically dressed immorally, right? dressed as those who are going to enter in uh, to unfaithful living. When we come to verse three, and this is where, so we get from the commands and now we're getting into the consequences, right? He says, lest, um, and we have to be really careful. And I, I want to be really careful as we think about a handful of things, as we think about 
uh, the Me Too movement that has unfolded in our culture, as we think about the Church Too movement that has unfolded uh, amongst evangelicalism, as we think about right a week and a half ago, we're living in the shadow of a well-known apologist of horrendous, evil things being found out about. Right. So when we read "Lest I Strip Her Naked," we have to remember that this is a collective thing that God is saying, not of an individual person, of a people. Right. So there's nothing. Um, and we'd be wrong to think about God in this way, but there's nothing abusive about what is happening. In fact, I think what we see, he says, lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born and make her like a wilderness and a parched land and kill her with thirst. That the second half of this verse, it's depicting a barren land, right? A fruitless land. It's depicting a place that has been left and untended to. And so when we read, lest I strip her naked, We can think of ancient artwork in this time that was depicting conquering civilizations, leading their captors away. The captors, they would be painted as unclothed as they're led away, right? Being shamed as they go through their experience. And I think uh, the original audience this was written to would have understood this to be referring to exile. That God is saying, lest you become an exiled people so that the land is barren and you are led away in your shame. We've talked about this, that that's a, the main consequence that sits before these people. He continues in verse four, and it's very strange. He says, upon her children, I will have no mercy because they are children of boredom. Right? He's speaking of the children, using them to instruct their mother. And, and now he's saying of you also, I will have no mercy. Think back to chapter one, right? Hosea's uh, child named no mercy. Because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. So we have to understand this isn't uh, some sort of unjust way in God where simply because these people are born into a corrupt society, they're being punished for it. They're being punished because they're born into a corrupt society and they're taking after their mother. They're learning the family business of idolatry and unfaithfulness, if you will. And so The Lord is saying, in the same way I'm saying I will not have mercy on your mother, the same is true of you. Therefore, calling for restoration, calling for turning, calling for repentance. As we get to 5b, this is where things begin to transition. We're beginning to see this idea of God's redemptive judgment. And we're going to see we go through a cycle here, if you can follow with me. And the cycle goes this way. God makes plain their sin, highlights what it is they're doing that is wrong. He then, with the the word therefore, you'll see it used three times in this chapter, twice in our text today, describes how he will redemptively punish them, how he will tear them down so he can build them back up, how he will tear them apart so that he might sew them back together. And then it ends with a future hope of restoration. So highlight their sin redemptive judgment that he will do, right? It's future tense. He says, I will. And then future restoration, the hope of restoration. So he highlights in 5b, for she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. What the Lord is highlighting, right, is that These unfaithful people, Israel at this time, they believe that all the good things they have are coming from the bales, right? They believe they are looking to these false gods and they are meeting their needs. So that uh, their pantries that are full and uh, their lives that have become comfortable, that they are giving thanks to Baal for these things. They think a false god has produced these things. And so therefore... God is going to make plain to them that that is not the case, right? God isn't toying around with his glory and credit being shared with false gods. And so he's going to make plain who he is. So then he says, therefore, I will hedge up her way with thorns and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. It's the Lord describing, I'm I'm going to build a hedge around her. I'm going to wall her in so that she can't find her lovers. If we think about this uh, metaphorically, right, it's like a husband who realizes that his wife has been unfaithful and he goes into the city planner's office and he makes sure that there is no path without construction from where they live 
to uh, to the other guy's house, right? Blocking the path, getting in the way. If we think about this in their context, it's like the Lord saying, I'll make it so you can't find the altars where Baal is worshiped. I'm going to block the doors to Baal's temple. He continues, she shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. It's really hard to say. Um, she shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. No matter how hard they search, no matter how they run after, the Lord is saying, I'm going to prevent you from finding them. Right? I'm going to hedge up your way. And he's actually contrasting himself with these false gods. He says, and she shall seek them, but shall not find them. That's the exact opposite of what he promised his people in Deuteronomy 4 about him. Right? He had said of himself, if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. And he says of these false gods, if you seek them with all your heart, I'll make sure that they don't turn up. I'll make sure you never see them. So this is that section where he's depicting his restorative judgment. And then it continues, then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. Then she will return to Yahweh. But I think we're even given a, a, a sense here of uh, what is lacking in the people of God at this point. What is lacking in Israel. The reason for returning to her first husband isn't depicted as because it's right, because he's good, because we've made covenant vows to one another. For it was better for me then than now. You know, it offers me something good. I'll, I'll go wherever the land is plentiful, wherever I think I might get more. If we're honest, we can be in danger of thinking this way, right? The Israelites, they're living this syncretistic life, or um, that's kind of a bigger word. So they're, they're saying we can just have a hodgepodge of everything. We'll take a little bit of Yahweh, a little bit of Baal, a little bit of fertility call. If some other God appears, we'll worship him too. And before we point the finger, I think we have to think about, does this mark our lives, right? Or better yet, in what ways does this mark our lives? Maybe like this, we have a little bit of Jesus sprinkled in with Christian nationalism. On the other side of the aisle, politically, if you will, maybe we have foundational Christian ethics blended with the latest social cause that grasps our attention. Maybe we have articulation of Christian doctrine, but ultimately at the end of the day, I actually let my Enneagram number shape more of how I view myself in the world than anything. Each week in Hosea, we're going to be lovingly confronted with an opportunity to consider where in my life am I not lined up with Scripture? Where have I created this dichotomy where I say one thing but live another? Where am I uh, just sprinkling whatever I think might make my life a little bit better, even if the Lord forbids it? So then we come to verse 8, and the cycle begins again. He's going to highlight their sin. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. So not only do they not know who is really providing for them, that Yahweh is caring and providing for his people, they take what Yahweh offers and they offer it to other gods. Tim Chester, he's a, a commentator, he puts it this way, it's like offering a present on Christmas morning under the tree that your spouse receives and then they go and thank their mistress for. What a startling picture, how deep that would cut and wound us. God has provided for all of their needs. He's given them in abundance, and they go and thank someone else. They worship and offer themselves to someone else. We actually see that the Israelites don't have a faithfulness problem. They are quite faithful to the Baals. They've chosen the wrong God, the one who hasn't redeemed them from Egypt, the one who hasn't covenanted to be their God for them to be his people. And in 9 through 13, then we get again into uh, this restorative judgment. Therefore, and we turn again and we get these I will statements of the Lord. I will take back my grain in its time and my wine in its season, and I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. Right? What else would a just God do if his people are believing that another God is providing for them than to take his hand of blessing. 
to say, I'll show you what Baal worship is going to lead you to. I'll show you the emptiness of it. God is far too kind and far too just to just continue lavishing on his people while they don't recognize who it's from and what it's for. And so he says he'll take it back, grain and wine and wool and flax, all of these things that Israel would be in need of for food and clothing and the things they need to live. These are the very things mentioned in Deuteronomy 28, where we see this chapter of blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. These are the very things mentioned that the Lord says he will take away. He assures them of it. He's not doing anything other than what he's told them he would do with their sin. In verse 10, now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. If we think back to Genesis 3, after the fall, the kind love of God, it clothes Adam and Eve in their nakedness, right? And now in his kind love, right, he hasn't changed. He's not dealing with his people differently. God determines for their shame to be known. He wants them to experience the consequences of their actions. So he says, I will uncover her lewdness. Think back, exiled, being led naked out of the city into a foreign land. And he says, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. Israel, if you hear my words, don't try to form a bigger army or don't go to Egypt or Assyria for help, thinking that they can thwart me. I'm God. No one's going to stand against me. No one's stopping the punishment I will bring. Verse 11, and I will put an end to all her mirth, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts. We have to stop and think it's so interesting that these fickle, divided heart people, that they are still doing all of the religious rituals, all of the events that marked Israel's calendar, they're still worshiping. They're still having the feasts and the new moons and the Sabbaths and all of these things. What a dangerous warning that is for you and I to think about how easy it is to go through the motions. What a actually sad and empty version of Christianity it would be if we're doing all of the right things, showing up at church, involved in a small group, but all the while in the back of our nine, in the back of our minds, someone or something else has captured our affections. Right? That we're looking for. Uh, someone other than our God who saves. And he says he will put an end to their celebration of these feasts. His half-heartedness, or their half-heartedness, it uh, angers the Lord. Verse 12, and I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, these are my wages, which my lover has given me. I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall devour them. Earlier, right, he said that he will take away their food and their wine and their wool and their flax, but now he's going much deeper. A good farmer has prepared for a bad harvest season, right? You can uh, have some extra in the storehouses. You can survive a bad year. But God's saying, I'm, I'm going to the root of this. I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, right? A good farmer, if you take away their crops, there's not a whole lot they can do. There's not a whole lot left to rely on. And so it's this picture, as we said from the beginning, the Lord getting to the root of the problem. He must tear down everything about what Israel has become in order to restore it. This we see sprinkled throughout the prophets. I, I think of, my mind was in Isaiah 6 last week. And the end of Isaiah 6 talks about, and from the stump of Jesse, a seed will come. That's what the Lord is promising. He is tearing down in order that he might Build back up. I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall devour them. I'll, I'll leave them to be run over by their enemies, to experience the judgment that they deserve. And then verse 13 kind of sums up all of what he's already said. I will punish her for her feast days of the bales. Remember, we see this syncretistic adding a little bit in sort of living. They keep the Jewish... Yahweh, Old Testament festivals, but they're also going to the feast days of the Baals. They're also offering uh, offerings to false gods. She adorned herself with her ring and her jewelry, once again, probably referring to uh, physically prostituting themselves, and they think pleasing Baal with this. And these last words are gutted and went after her lovers and forgot me, declares the Lord. Brothers and sisters, I hope we see sin as personal this morning. 
that our sin is not uh, the breaking of some abstract rules, right? It is the breaking of the law. I don't want to downplay that, but even more so before that, it is the rebellion against a person, the forsaking of the God who created us. And for those of us who are in Jesus has redeemed us in Christ. This whole circumstance, it points forward. I hope we can see this too. Israel doesn't just need some, some new laws or a touch-up. They need new hearts. They need someone who will come and live the way Israel was supposed to live to fulfill the law. They need someone who will actually offer himself up in their stead, taking on the punishment that they deserve, becoming exiled outside the city on a cross in order that they might find true life, and eternal life, and be restored to know their God. We're going to see time and time again in this whole book, it screams for the need of a Savior, and we know him to be Jesus. It turns our eyes and our attention and our affection toward him. It ought to make us so grateful for who he is and what he's done. It exposes uh, more than I think we're prone to realize our need for the Son of God to die on behalf of sinners and be raised in a second. So, this is what we see. I've said there was a cycle, and you'll note that we didn't get to the last part of it. Because next week when we come, verses 14 through 23, they are all about this future restoration. This hope of restoration that is to come. Because despite everything that God has said, he is so committed to his covenant promises that he's not going to abandon his people. He will love them, and as we see, he will woo them back to himself. And we know this to happen in Christ. So before I pray, uh, questions, thoughts. Um, I should have taken a break in the middle, but I did not. But uh, things that weren't clear, things that could have been explained better. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I know there are some, right? Yeah, here. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, great. That's uh, something I want to be very clear on. So um, in some ways, the American church, if we think about this, right, has become something it was never intended to. Right? Um, in a lot of cases, a, a people marked by a love or a treasure of something above the Lord, right? Uh, and, and we're, you know, in some ways in Parkside, I'm sure guilty of falling into the same trap. So I'm not trying to point the finger at anyone else. And so to become the church as we're intended to be, sometimes that's even going to mean distancing ourselves, not physically, right? We need the church from the practices of the unfaithful, is what I'm saying. And that will cost us in a variety of ways. Does that make more sense? Great. Thank you for asking a, a clarifying question. I would hate to. What's up? Yeah, so. Um, no, 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 no. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Did I mean to stay on the spot? Uh, if we think about um, like something that would come to my mind is the sort of seeker sensitive movement, if I can use that language, that marks American evangelicalism. That many churches uh, say, come as you are, you never have to change, like just, just fill our room, right? Uh, come, give us your money, like we'll take you for who you are. And there's some good in all of those things, right? Like we want sinful people like us to be able to walk through our doors and to recognize that. But I don't think a sinner, someone living in direct uh, volitional rebellion against God should actually feel comfortable when they come to church. There should be something unsettling in them. Oh gosh, like maybe, maybe this place isn't for me, right? Of uh, these, these people seem to have something that I don't. And that's not to make us pompous and judgmental towards people, it's to remind us of the grace we receive. And so um, think about all of the ways, right, in which we could point the finger where we say there are churches, ourselves included, doing things that the Bible doesn't prioritize or prescribe. And we have to think long and hard about these things. Thanks, Do you have something? experience uh, very similarly. And the, I think the only real encouragement we can take is not that we are any better than them, but that we belong to a better covenant with a better mediator, with a 
better promises. And that's our only goal. So who? Oh, it, it, it's very great that way. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, Helen, Helen was saying, it feels like this marks the whole Bible, this half-heartedness, this dividedness, um, which is true. And it, it marks my life in ways that it shouldn't. And so the only hope we have is not that we're better than them, but we belong to a new and better covenant with a better mediator, better promises. That's great news for us today. Uh, friends on Zoom, you guys have questions? You can hear us. That's good. We couldn't hear the people asking questions. We can, we can hear you, Mac. We can hear you, oh, Mac. One second, Amy. Pause and go. We can hear you, but we can't hear the questions in the room. And so we're hearing 50% yes. of the answer. Well, that's not good. Um, <laughs> you, I, I think I think you knew that, but, but maybe right. I'll just uh, affirm it. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So there's uh, yeah, a handful of things we're up against. Um, we ordered this week, uh, there's gonna be like a new, it's like a, people use them for conference calls, like thing that will be around the room. So um, that will help us in the future, but it is, it is obviously not making uh, things better today. So um, we have a few minutes left. Let's take that time to split off into groups of people around us, uh, maybe to rehearse some of the things that stood out to us and to have occasion to pray for one another. Um, reminder, again, if you have prayer requests, write them on a card, send me an email, um, whatever it might be. Um, Brian and Amy, would you guys be willing to have a discussion amongst the Zoom people? There's no no guy there to fix stuff yet? Yep. As long as the Zoom people will tolerate us. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Are you, are we off of speaker? I'm guessing maybe we're off of speaker at this point. Yeah, I think he muted us. Okay, all right. I hope. Hi, Zoomies. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I forgot what, what, what are we supposed to actually be discussing? Just questions about the passage? Are we doing prayer requests and things? Is that, is that what he said? I didn't even pay attention to what he said. <laughs> We can do whatever we want, right? <laughs> I do, Mike. <laughs> you guys usually zoom me. This is this is our first gig zooming since May, September, whatever. So, what do you guys usually do? Chris, what do you guys usually do? Well, um, usually it's a lot of times we've had the intern lead us. And you know he would have questions to ask us, and then we would um, pray and stuff like that. So, well, I think usually, yeah, I think usually there are questions on the sheet that we'll go through, but um, there weren't questions on the sheet. So maybe we'll go to prayer request. Any comments or thoughts about the passage that Mac just talked about? Can I make one observation? Yeah. I think he, I was hard to hear, but I think that the back mentioned Christian nationalism. I think so, yeah. I don't know if everybody knows what it is. I would a little bit about it, but um, it's just a tendency to make, uh, make our political <laughs> stance uh, in, the, in this country a higher value than that in our lives. I gave an answer to the Personally, with a Hang on. Have you Let's see if we can get some muting going on. I was going to text Kelsey, but I don't want to get a text to. I know. I actually just texted Kelsey. Did you? Thank you. That was the only one I could think of. <laughs> but no, just bombarded with so much political stuff. Again, Mike. Bombarded with so much political stuff that we got to watch our hearts. 
No, I, I think you're right. I think you made a good point about, um, I, I mean, I think that's a good comparison to the passage that if, if Israel was being, like, like when, I, when I first read it, I was just picturing, you know, I was picturing um, that they just completely ran to the bales. And so the, the way that he described it is, you know, they, they kept one foot in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the Lord's commands and then, and then the other on the other side. So I think that's a great comparison for us to consider in, especially in America is, is trusting in, in political things and so forth. And, um, and, and I think we've, we've seen more and more and more lately. And I think probably even more that that will not, that will not satisfy, um, you know, and so um, in some ways it feels, it feels similar that he will, he'll strip away the, whatever it is that we think we're going to get out of, out of political things. In the, the political or, or the state or. Yeah. What you think are supposed to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Need to make sure our trust is in the Lord. Amen. Yeah. Security is really an illusion outside of Christ. <laughs> yeah. Well said. Anything else from the, the passage? Okay. Um, prayer requests, ways that we could be praying for, for all of you this week. I will say Dennis has had a chronic cough and sore throat, and it seems like it has been going on since he had uh, surgery and they intubated him and he's been mm -hmm. to the doctor a number of times, but it will not go away. And, and of course he's in the middle of tax season at work. So taking time to go to the doctor now is hard, but uh, anyway, we're just praying that it'll just go away. And then maybe that his doctor can refer him to somebody who will help him because this has been going on way too long. <clears throat> This is a month. And you know when you're, pardon? This is like a month, isn't it? Oh, it's been since August. So, um, yeah. And, you know, we don't want to be sitting in church with him coughing and, you know, because people get a little fearful mm. when you're hacking, you know. <laughs> so, anyway. So. So I'm going to put someone on the spot. Jemima, I've never pray, prayed for you before. I'm Amy. This is Brian. Um, I've never prayed for you. Is there something that we can pray for you this week? Um, say definitely just my time in the word with God each morning. Um, just being, I guess, intentional there and especially thinking about people in my life I could be praying for right now and ways I could be reaching out to them. And did I say your first name correctly? Mm -hmm. Did I? Okay. Okay. Anyone else? We would appreciate prayer for... Uh that we can get on a list somewhere to get uh, vaccinations. <laughs> or, or we're on lists, but actually get an appointment where we qualify, but uh, just haven't been able to get uh, on a, a, an appointment. Um, I have a trip to Mexico that's uh, pending <laughs> a vaccination. So we'd, we'd appreciate prayer for that. Also, we're looking at the possibility of making a, a move as far as changing houses, and we just appreciate prayer for that. Big decisions. Yeah. I don't know if you'd want to, but the house across the street from us is going up on the market March 1st. <laughs> <laughs> That's not closer to my grandchildren, sorry. 
Uh, <laughs> where, <it's not. laughs> where are you thinking about moving? Uh, <clears throat> farther west than we are. <clears throat> Our Colorado West? No, or no, no, no. Rocky no, no. River. Our <laughs> kids are in Strongsville. <laughs> Good question, Dennis. I was thinking the same yeah. thing. <laughs> Or you could go south, you know, like Mexico, and um, <laughs> where it's warmer. Not Texas. <clears throat> no, that is not on the list. No, the kids are in Strongsville. Okay. The grandkids are in Strongsville. It's 45 minutes each way. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Now, how about the Castleberries? I know you have a furnace oh. issue. Do you guys need space heaters? <laughs> uh oh, sorry. <laughs> Willow. <laughs> it, is, it is currently running and it's nice and toasty in here. Apparently I did turn it up a full de a degree even higher than it was. It's currently running. Thank you. Um, so. It was brisk in our house this morning and it wouldn't, it wouldn't turn on. Yeah. No. And we went, it's cool in here. And then at one point I went, let me look at the thermostat. Oh, that says 66. That's not, that's not right. And I realize for some people it's like 66. Well, yeah, that's our normal temperature in the house in the winter. It's not ours. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if you want the second floor to be higher than 60. Yeah. Oh, we have that issue too. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I think for us, I was thinking through people, um, people in our lives that maybe have impact for the gospel. And I've asked some folks to pray for, I have a coworker, um, I've never met him in person. It's all been, you know, over the computer conversations. Um, but just, he's very open to talking about things. And so it just seemed like, oh, there may be some good opportunities for the gospel here. And then a couple of weeks ago, um, he he went out on, on medical. And all that we know, which is probably more than we should have, have found out, but was that he was, at that time anyway, in the ICU on a ventilator. And that's all we know. And he's a fairly young guy too. So, um, so I don't know what happened there, but just prayers for the Lord to be working in his heart during this time. And then assuming he comes back, if I have those opportunities to talk with him, um, you know, that I, that I get, that I take the best advantage of, of however I have opportunities. Um, and What's then, his first name? oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. His first name's Scott. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. You bet. And then um, my, I, we mentioned, I mentioned my parents typically, and I'll put them on the prayer request sheet, but they are 81 and 82. Um, and best we can tell they're not saved. And mm -hmm. so we, we pray for them. Um, and then. Um, and their names are Tom and Jean. Tom, yeah, sorry. And then we have a, a kind of a family friend, Colleen and her son, Alex, this past attacked by their dog. Mm -hmm. And um, we don't know where they are spiritually. My guess is they're, they're also not believers. Um, and so she went to uh, Metro. They, they transferred her from Hillcrest. Oh, my. Caused me out yeah. of some trauma. Um, I didn't even tell you this. So, my, so she, oh, okay. she is home now. No, no. My, my sister said she got, um, she had surgery on her arm. So, um, but she's home. So I guess that's, that's good. But just, um, again, for for the gospel to enter their hearts. And this was a neighbor? A uh, family friend. Oh, okay. Almost like the fifth Castleberry kid. Like Colleen spent as much time in Brian's house growing up as Brian did. Yikes. And she's she's the kind of friend that um, a, like things just happen to Colleen. And some of them are because she can't make a good decision. And some of them are because things just happen to Colleen. And that really stinks. So what was her son's name? Alex. Alex. And is he, did he have to have surgery or anything? Is he okay? I think, I think he's, he's okay. I, I think they had to convince him to go to the hospital, number one, to get checked out. And then number two, to, to see how his mom was doing. But um, so he did, you know, he, he did sustain some injuries, but I, I think like an ambulance took her to the hospital and then they said, Hey, maybe you should go get checked out. So. Yes. 
Any other requests before we pray? Eunice and Jerry listening to us? Yes, we are. Actually, I'm sorry that I just cannot put myself on the camera because I look really horrible this morning. <laughs> <laughs> The, the thing is, um, you know, I have a huge, I think I've been kind of feeling really sick uh, for some period of time. Um, and I just have these huge blisters on my lips and it just looks not that great. So sorry, guys. Um, but I'm thinking of you guys and just praying for you guys. So I'm here. How can we pray for you? Um, I, I mean, for us, I think it just every day, hopefully that we can just really dwell in God's presence and his peace. I think that's the major um, thing that I really wanted to pray for so that every day when we wake up, um, just try to start a day um, to be able to, you know, listen to God's voice and just try to walk in the Lord, um, you know, just, just fully, you know, feel his presence. I think that's what I really long for. Jerry, do you want? Well. No. <laughs> yeah, Jerry's quiet. <laughs> Jerry's quiet. This is brand new information. What? what? <laughs> he's, he's not really talking much. I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, for us, maybe that's the, and then also um I do you, can I share your whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he's gonna be starting his new job in March. Um, so hopefully that he can um, you know, anytime there's a new environment, um, you know, you just pray for, you know, have an opportunity to be able to <coughs> relationship in the Lord and being able to grow together in the Lord, even though um, it's still in the word. <laughs> so hopefully that um, we can, you know, just try to, you know, be in the Lord, whatever we are. All right. Well, how about we we pray and um, I'll just I'll just open it up to you know I think there's a small group we can all just start to talk when when we want to pray and then when it feels like we've we finished then I'll close us. Thank you so much, 